One of the books that's out there is, Does God Want Christians to Perform Miracles Today? And uh, Dr. Whitcomb, you may have to rewrite this because you have performed a miracle. John, San John Sanders is here on a Sunday evening. Yes, yes. Why are you clapping? Half of you never show up on a Sunday evening. <laughs> it's really, really thrilling to see everybody here, in all seriousness. It's, uh, it's wonderful. I believe that you believe that God has a word for us this week. Somebody asked me this morning, uh, following the second service, why are we having a Bible conference on prophecy? And the only answer I could think of was, because we believe the end of the story matters. Isn't that true? Amen. We believe that. We also believe it matters now, because the story is still going on. As Dr. Whitcomb reminded us this morning, Revelation 1.3 says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. And certainly we notice that, right? The time has to be near. Good grief, as Kathy Norris said, when you have men having babies. I mean, this world is going nuts. Gone nuts. So God has definitely and continues to bless us with Dr. Whitcomb. So I'm sure that you all know him by now, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So Dr. Whitcomb, we thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come and speak to us. So come, brother. While we're waiting, I want to congratulate everyone for being here on a rainy night. I can't imagine rain in Seattle. <laughs> but thank you for your, your support, your encouragement in this conference. And as we mentioned this morning, there are several things on the book table that I thought would be of special interest to you. There's a sign-up sheet where you can get a free subscription for six months to this excellent magazine on prophecy called Israel my glory so we it's on the, this end of the table outside here and we hope that you will take advantage of that offer and uh, that one, this will help I think. Right. <laughs> all right can, can anyone hear yeah, yeah that's good all right thank you thank you Coming through, all right. Also, friends, uh, uh, our series of books on the table on Bible prophecy, uh, which is our focus this week. It's a set of three, special price for all three. One, how God showed in the book of Esther how he takes care of Israel in times of enormous crisis, even though his name is not even mentioned once in the book. That's a very important point because it's a comparison, an analogy, a parallel to what's happening today. God is not officially endorsing Israel today. Very important point, because no Israelite, as such, is worshiping God in truth. They have rejected Jesus, but they're still what? His people. So he has amazingly providential ways, not miraculous, okay, to protect Israel even in the midst of her unbelief. Okay, it's Esther and the destiny of Israel. And then of course, our commentary in the book of Daniel, very foundational book for Bible prophecy as the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15. And then a thousand years of Israel's history. You see friends, this is the important thing for Christians in a Bible prophecy study. What is Israel? Christians are abysmally ignorant of what God's plan, purpose was for the nation of Israel. Were they just a temporary program that failed and so he's dumped them forever? Oops, I guess that didn't work. I don't have any chosen people. Except now, the church has replaced Israel? No, never. We have several books. The last one sold out. Others are gone on the table now, but we want you to feel free to 
order things from us and let us know how we can help along that line. The blue order form, please take that for your family and friends. And uh, we just are so thrilled, friends, that God has provided for us excellent books now. The one that just sold out tonight is called Future Israel. Excellent. But you have to tell me if you want it, because it's not even on the order form. It's so new. An older book that's not on the order, order form that's famous is The Greatness of the Kingdom by Alva J. McLean. Again, if you're interested in that book, you'll have to tell me. Now, and here's another book on dispensationalism, Tomorrow and Beyond. I have contributed two chapters. Other dispensational theologians have contributed. And this is another book you'll have to tell me about. Just give me a, if you're a member of the church, don't even bother writing your address. Just give me your name and say, church member. We'll order it for you. We're anxious to get these things into the hands of people who are interested, okay? And we thank you for your enthusiasm, your comments of encouragement so far in our prophecy conference for the year 2008. I just can't imagine there ever being a 2009. I mean, the way things are shaping up on this planet and even in our own country, we say, Lord, how much longer, how much longer are you gonna delay your coming? All right, now friends, we want to remind you again here of our 70th week of Daniel chart. Because this morning we discovered, I hope with great joy and appreciation to God for the blessed hope exclusively for the bride and body of Christ, the rapture event right here. How many Christians will be going up? All true Christians. Men, women, and children all over the world are going up instantaneously, totally. And the minute we go up, we, our attitude will change. We won't say to other Christians, true Christians, who may have been mistaken on certain points of prophecy and eschatology, <laughs> I, I told you so. <laughs> How many agree that our attitude will be improved? The thing that will really concern us is how did we qualify to be going up? Thank, thank you, Lord, for, for your amazing fulfillment of a prophecy that you said to us several times in the New Testament that we never fully understood, but you really meant what you said, and that's what we're here for. What did God really mean by what he said in the only book he's ever written? Now, our topic tonight, friends, is right here. The church confronted by Christ. I was so thankful for the music tonight, weren't you? Christ-centered music. Yeah. Now watch. Here's what's a little bit frightening. At the judgment seat. Now say judgment seat. You mean Christians are going to be judged by Christ? We thought that the minute we were saved, we were justified from all our sins, past, present, and future forever. Correct. But this is a totally different kind of judgment, you see? Because the judgment seat of Christ will not determine whether you're saved or not. That was all settled where? By the fact that you went up in the rapture, see? That you were glorified. The judgment throne will determine what? Your rewards. Not whether you're saved, but what kind of a reward, if any, you and I will receive from Jesus on that occasion. Now, friends, as I suggested, I think, this morning, this to me is one of the most confusing and difficult doctrines of Bible prophecy. What's going to happen to Christians a split second after resurrection and rapture? Okay? The wrong attitude is this. The minute we see Jesus, we'll be happy forevermore. Now, wait a minute. There's a difference between happiness and joy, okay? Watch, watch this now. Our attitude will be perfect. We will not complain to Jesus about what he says about us or whether or not we get a reward because we will see things as he sees them. Remember that verse in 1 John 3? When we see him, we'll be what? Like him, like him, for we shall see him as he is. And therefore, our perspectives, our attitudes, 
how we view ourselves and what we've done as Christians on this earth, what others have done, what Jesus did for us, and what he's going to decide concerning us. We'll totally agree. We're not going to appeal to some higher court. <laughs> That's it. We've arrived at the judgment throne. The bema is the Greek word of Christ. In 1952, with about 75 other pastors and teachers, I had a six weeks tour of the Holy Land. Fabulous opportunity to visit these places spoken of in the Bible. And one place we stopped was the city of Corinth. Now that's going to be a special focus tonight. That was the most difficult church Paul ever had to deal with. Filled with problems and dissensions and heresy and immoralities. You say, how could that have been a church? Good question. I'm sure... <laughs> Paul said, examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Are you people really, really Christians? And of course, he made it clear right from the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, you are a true church of Jesus Christ, but a church filled with problem people. It's unbelievable, unbelievable. But you see, friends, on that occasion, what's going to happen when the rapture takes place to the Corinthian Christians who went up, who who will go up at the resurrection, not the rapture, because they're dead, okay? They're going up. And when they get up there, friends, they will discover that they're going to face the Bema. Now, wait a minute. What's the Bema? We visited Corinth and saw they had just excavated an enormous white marble platform. I mean, almost as big as this whole platform up here. And right in the front, it had in Greek, Bema, the judgment throne to which people were brought who were being accused of various things to be evaluated, okay? Bema. Well, Paul used that same word when he told the church of Corinthians, we must all appear before the Bema, the judgment throne of Christ. Now, all through the New Testament, the Bible writers, Paul, John, Peter, were constantly talking about the Bema, the judgment, of whether or not you're going to reward or not or a crown or not. Uh, you know, this year we're going to have some little crowns handed out in August in Beijing, China. Has anybody heard about this? No. It makes you tremble to think about this, but uh, it's the Olympics. And Paul knew about the Olympics. I mean, the Olympics had started long before Paul was here. You knew that, didn't you? Well over 2,000 years these games have been played. And, and Paul said, you run... He said to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, you run in such a way that you may obtain the prize. Keep working at it. Keep moving ahead. Keep going forward because something is awaiting you when you get to the end. Jesus will be there and determine whether you get a reward and if so, what kind. My. Well, you know what he said to Timothy in his last chapter, the last book he ever wrote? 2 Timothy 4. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have what? Kept the faith. Now watch. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, and not for me only, but also for all those who await his, who look for, who love his appearing. Not just for me, Paul said, but for all others. Now look what that did. It motivated him to work, to serve, to suffer, to be consistent, to be faithful, to be true to the end. He was overwhelmed by what? The magnificence of the possibility of receiving a crown from Jesus himself. Now, James, the half-brother of Jesus, said in chapter 1, that if you suffer for his sake, you'll receive the crown of life. But listen to 1 John chapter 2. This is a little scary. John said, now little children, speaking to believers, like all of us tonight, Abide in him, in Christ, so that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. You say, wait a minute. Believers ashamed when Jesus comes? Oh, yes. John was tremendously concerned about that. You can be ashamed at the second. You said, now, wait a minute, sir. I thought we'll be happy forevermore. Now, wait a minute. You can be ashamed when you see Jesus, and I struggle with this myself, how this is going to work. You can be ashamed when you see him and hear him say, not well done, not good servant, not faithful servant. You've lost your reward. 
You lost it. But how can you be joyful when you lose something? If you see why you lost it, because of what you did or didn't do for Jesus, in order to honor his discernment and his perspectives on what you really are and what you've said, done, and thought since you were saved. Remember, nobody's at the judgment throne of Christ except believers, born-again Christians. So we're talking something totally different than whether you're going to get saved or lost. That's all been settled before at the cross. Okay? Here's what John recorded in Revelation 3. Hold fast to that which you have that no, one, that no one can take your crown. You can allow somebody else to deceive you, to mislead you, and lo lose your crown. Oh, no. Oh, no. Really? Well, he said to the church at Smyrna in Revelation 2, Suffer, suffer, be ready to die for your faith that you may have the crown of life. I mean, that motivated thousands of martyrs in the early church to die for their faith, folks. And thousands of Christians in China today are dying for their faith, and in Africa, and in Asia. In fact, the only country I've ever heard of where nobody's ever suffering for Jesus is the United States. That's why it's hard for us even to face this. Some Christians, more Christians, have died for their faith in the last hundred years than all previous centuries combined. Wow. Think of it. People, in order to receive a crown from Jesus, have been willing to die a martyr's death. Okay? All right? Now, the bride of Christ will not be perfectly freed from sin, okay, its power and its presence, until we meet the Lord Jesus. Okay? Who's going to be there? Every born-again Christian who's ever lived since the beginning of the church 2,000 years ago. Millions and millions and millions of Christians. Well, how can Jesus evaluate perfectly every Christian and everything we've ever said, thought, or done? May I make this statement? Here's an announcement. You may quote me. Jesus is very intelligent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> he knows everything about everything. In fact, he knows four things. Remember this. He knows everything that's ever happened. He knows everything that is happening. He knows everything that's going to happen. And he knows everything that would have happened if something else hadn't happened. <laughs> you say, well, what's that? He said, if Sodom and Gomorrah had heard what you've heard and seen what you've seen, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Wow. Would you kind of agree, Jesus is very intelligent. He knows every thought that went behind every word and every act and every motive and reason for every act we've ever performed since we were saved. That's why the Bible says he has eyes like a flame of fire. I mean, he can see in the dark, okay? Why? Jesus, I don't want to be ashamed before you at your coming. Please help me understand what this means, what this means, okay? Now, you don't have to turn, just listen. I'm reading some passages that tell us about this. Romans 14, 10. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So then, each of us shall give account of himself to God. It's not what he did or she did or he, it's what I've said and done. That should be a major concern for me now in the light of what's coming. 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear, and notice we, Paul thought he was going to be, you know, going to be there too, and he will be. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in this body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Recompense for things I've done that are bad. Now you see the problem, folks? Because it is absolutely true that the minute we are saved, born again, regenerated, you see, by the Holy Spirit, every bad thing we ever had done was cared for. In fact, everything, every bad thing we ever will do is cared for in what sense? That we are redeemed and rescued from an eternal hell where we deserve to be. That's settled. 
But this is something totally different. Totally different. You say, well, what do you mean totally different? Because here's, here's a, an opportunity, you see, friends, to receive or not to receive a reward and what that does to Jesus. You say, what do you mean? Well, well just think a minute. Those who do receive a crown, according to the book of Revelation, will do what with their crown? Cast it down before the feet of Jesus to say, Lord Jesus, what you gave me, I really didn't deserve. I just thank you for this magnificent reward. I give it back to you. And you say, well, then I don't care whether I get a reward or not, because I'm going to lose it anyway. Wait a minute. If you don't have anything to offer Jesus to thank him, there will be a sense in which you will be deeply ashamed. Deeply ashamed before him. Now, did you, you know, I struggle with this too. Lord, I really don't care about the rewards. All I really care about is I'm going to heaven forever. Ever, ever thought like, thought like that? I'm not going to suffer for Jesus' sake because I'll be in heaven no matter what I do or don't do. That's a very dangerous attitude because Jesus has said so many things in the Bible about the, the rewards that he has planned and prepared and the crowns for those who love him that if you despise his program of rewards, it's an insult to him personally. Now just think of it this way. God created every human being in this planet with a what? With a capacity to be motivated at the, at the expectation of, the anticipation of a reward. Now, I was raised in a military home. In fact, <clears throat> I've probably shared with you in previous times, my father was a great military leader. He was in the First World War and the Second World War in Europe, a West Point graduate, a very high-ranking officer. Our next-door neighbor in Fort Benning, Georgia in 1939, 40, and 41 was George Patton under whom he served as a chief of staff in the Third Army in Europe. My dad was a master of tactics, strategy, uh, I mean, military history, uh, weapons, enemies. I mean, it's all I heard from child. I was an only child in the home. It made so much difference to my father and to all of us as to what rank a person had. Is he a four-star general, a, a general, a two-star one, a lieutenant, a mere corporal? What is he? It makes a huge difference as to your function, the respect that you would you know, have from others beneath you, uh, your responsibility level, uh, a sort of a visual, what? Token of appreciation for your faithfulness through the years, the rank you've achieved, you see, makes a huge difference. And it's been shown that if you eliminated all rewards, all ranks, all privileges, all authority in an army, the whole thing would collapse. You say, well, I don't, I don't have to be motivated by rewards. Oh, really? Then you're not a true human being. Thank you. <laughs> now, think, think of education. It's amazing what difference it makes to a student to be motivated by what? Recognition, appreciation, a good grade, a public you know, honors at the end of the line. Uh, summa cum laude, see? Magna, or whatever. Uh, uh, you know, uh, an awards ceremony. You did the finest job of all these students, and you're going to be publicly acknowledged. S you know, subconsciously, friends, that has an enormous influence and impact on your motivation to get with it, to do what? Discipline yourself and study and, and do well and please your teachers and administrators. Because it's been shown that if you have a school with no rewards, no recognition at all, no grades, the system collapses. That's true of industry, rewards, motivation, do better. If you do, this will happen. The whole human race is designed that way. I don't care what system you're talking about. Because God did that for a purpose. And if all that's important, so is this. You say, I think I, think I see, sir, what you're saying. <sighs> Wait till you see, listen to what the Apostle Peter said about this day that's coming. This is kind of scary. He said, for judgment must begin at the house of God, the church. I mean, we're the highest privileged group in the universe, and we're going to get judged first, right here, before Israel, before the nations, before the angels, before anybody else. Church first will be judged. You know what he said? 
it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what shall the end be of those that know not the Lord? If what? If it's with difficulty, we're saved. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> what do you mean, Peter? <laughs> it means there's going to be a confrontation, and some people are going to suffer a loss at the Bema. Really? Okay. Now, friends, I invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians 3. This is the big one. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Remember those Corinthians, they're asking for this. And Paul said, I just want to be very open with you people. Your misconduct, your heresies, your divisiveness will be confronted by Jesus Christ the Lord. Okay? <clears throat> First Corinthians 3, verse 10. Are you there? Yep. According to the grace of God which was given to me, says Paul, as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building upon it. Now he's talking about how the church at Corinth was started in the first place. He said, I was the first preacher you ever heard. I started it under God. Then another came along and built upon that. Who was that? Apollos a magnificent Bible student from Alexandria, Egypt, that Paul highly admired and recommended, okay? I laid a foundation, another, that's Apollos, is building upon it, but let each man be careful how he builds upon it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, we're talking about Christians now that have a foundation in Jesus, the Savior, okay? Now, verse 12, if any man builds upon the foundation, that's Jesus, the Savior, with gold and silver and precious stones, if you have a life, friends, a testimony, a ministry, service that is exemplary, that is pure, that is, that is precious, wonderful, praise the Lord. Oh, but look, there's an option, an alternative, a choice here. Look what other kind of superstructure you can build on your foundation of Christ the Savior. Look at this. Wood, hay, and straw. Uh-oh. At first glance, it may be okay. Until what? Until the fire comes. Now watch. You say fire? At the judgment throne of Christ, Christians will face fire? Look. Verse 13. Each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it. That's the Bema. That's the day of the judgment throne of Christ. Because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. You say, oh no. When we get to see Jesus, we'll have to face the fire? By the way, did you know that this is one of the proof texts for the Roman Catholic Church for their idea of what? Purgatory. Purgatory. Careful on that one, folks. What they say is the opposite of what God says. This fire is only for whom? Born again Christians, whose salvation is not in doubt or question at all, ever. See? But the Catholic idea of purgatory is that you have to pay for your sins. This is blasphemy. It is. I mean, Jesus paid the price, folks. You're not going to earn your way to heaven by suffering in purgatory. This is horrible perversion of God's truth. Yeah. But now watch. You say, now wait a minute. What do you mean fire then? Keep reading. <clears throat> Verse 14. If any man's work which he has built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. If you have some gold, some silver, some precious stones in your, in your life as a Christian, service for God, faithful, effect, you know, fervent, effectual prayer for others, a sacrificial giving for the worthy works of the gospel, uh, encouragement to others, etc., etc., etc. I mean, enormous numbers of things the New Testament says we're to do. We're to, you know, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. See? Speak the words of God in truthfulness, not in arrogance or pride. I mean, hundreds of things that will determine 
whether we're doing the work of the Lord in a way that pleases and honors Him. The New Testament is full of it. Okay? Don't have to worry about where to get help on that one. You don't have to say, well, God never told me what I was supposed to do as a Christian. Oh, friends, just take one little peek into the New Testament. You see, just one little peek. Now listen. <clears throat> if a man's work which he has built upon it remains, remains from what? Just watch what's coming. Right. He shall receive a reward, a crown. But if any man's work is burned up, now wait a minute, who's burned up? The work, not the man. Catch that point? You're not in the fire. It's not purgatory. Your works are in the fire. What do you mean my works are in the fire? Keep reading. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss. You mean he'll lose his salvation? No, no, no. Quick, keep reading. But he himself shall be saved. You say, then it doesn't make any difference. Oh, no, keep reading. <laughs> Yet so as by what? Fire. Now, wait a minute. The, the works that you have spent years building up on that foundation of Christ could evaporate like that. When those eyes, like, I mean, our God is a consuming fire. He cannot tolerate what? Fakey, false, pretentious, untrue, you know, sinful things that claim to be God-honoring. You knew that. I mean, Jesus can't, be, you can't deceive him. Don't try to fool him. He won't take a bribe. I mean, you understand, we're, we've arrived at the supreme court of the universe right here. And Jesus said, just trust me, dear child. You, your works, I mean, you yourself are saved, settled. Did you catch that? But your works are in jeopardy. You, say, we, you stop and think, of course they have to be. Because many of us, and I include myself, have said things, done things, that really weren't properly motivated for the glory of God. I mean, let me ask it this way. Why did you even come to church today? You say, well, uh, come to think about it, maybe it wasn't just to honor the Lord, to learn about Him, to worship Him, to praise Him. I, I maybe just wanted to come because I've been doing that for years and, and I, 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 I want to see somebody at the church and meet some people and on and on and on. You know, God says, just stop for a minute, dear child. Why do you do what you do? What's your motive? That's what infinitely concerns him. And anything we do, everything we've ever done as Christians that is false, fake, you know, hypocritical, dishonest, unworthy, will evaporate in the flame. Gone. It's gone. You'll be saved, but what? Your works have vanished. No reward, no crown, nothing. Well, folks, let's put it this way. The way Christ judges his people is vastly, profoundly different from the way we evaluate people. Yeah. Didn't you sort of suspect that anyway? That's, I mean, that's one of the major points tonight, because this is a difficult topic. You have to recognize how perfect he is. You wouldn't want it any other way, would you? That he'd be deceived and fooled by some hypocrite or somebody who claimed things that weren't true? You knew that, didn't you? Okay? Now listen. Here's how he judges people. Ready? According to the degree of light and understanding, he will judge us according to how much we really knew and had been taught and therefore were accountable for. The more you learn, that's why a prophecy conference like this is dangerous. <laughs> Because you'll never be able to say again, well, I never knew. I never heard about this. <laughs> now listen to what he said. Luke 12, 47. That slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accordance with his will shall receive many lashes, but... Now this is, this is hard. I mean, I, this is really hard. But the one who did not know his will and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. He'll be beaten, not as severely as the man who knew better and acted in the light of what he knew disrespectfully. Wow. Why does a man who never knew anything about it get punished at all? Okay, here's, an, here's your answer. Headlines, Monday morning, tomorrow. 
local paper. Dr. John Whitcomb, guest lecturer at Valley Bible Church, was put into prison for running through the town 95 miles an hour. And when he was stopped, he was asked, did you know what you were doing? No, I didn't. I hadn't the faintest idea what the speed limit here was. <laughs> oh, really? Well, then you're free. Oh, no, you're not. Because your ignorance was what? Culpable. You should have found out what the speed limit is before you take this dangerous machine called an automobile through a city and you could kill somebody. You're responsible for what? Your ignorance. But what if you really did know and broke the speed limit? In God's way of evaluating, your guilt is even greater. You say that I'm not going to learn anything more. <laughs> well, you'll be judged for not wanting to learn then. <laughs> you say, well, I can't get out of this then. No. <laughs> you can't. You can't escape. <laughs> But here's the really hard one. Jesus will judge us according to the motives of our hearts, the reasons why we did or didn't do what we did or didn't do. You say, really? Luke 8, 17. Nothing is hidden that shall not become evident, nor anything secret that shall not be known and come to light, because God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ, Romans 2, 16. Now listen to this one. 1 Corinthians 4. This is for those Corinthians now and for us tonight. The one who examines me, says Paul, is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time. Don't think you have evaluated everybody in this church or in this community as God would evaluate them. That's correct. Be careful. Okay, I'm talking to myself. But wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in this darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then shall each man's praise come to him from God. When Jesus confronts us right there, at last, finally, completely, totally, every Christian will be perfectly evaluated as to where he fits in the ranking of God's praises and honors and crowns and rewards. Some people, friends, we've never even heard of before. Some suffering grandmother on her bed just praying fervently and genuinely to Jesus for somebody's salvation up here. Some famous person you've heard about for years down here somewhere. You knew that, didn't you? We'll be surprised. You know, Jesus gave some illustrations of that. One day they went to the temple. He went, he and his disciples to the temple and saw a desperately poor widow woman throw two mites into the treasury. What did he say about her? She has given everything she's got. Where these wealthy men, you know, publicly pouring in big bags of coins and so forth to attract attention are down here somewhere. Even if they make it to heaven. Don't you think Jesus watches the motives, the circumstances, the conditions of our lives to evaluate what we've done or haven't done for him? That's, that's sobering, folks. So you say, well, what, what's the measuring stick Jesus uses? You, you knew this one. It's this. Oh, yeah. Right here. Are you ready for this? The word of God is living. It's powerful. Yes. You know, we, we have a, 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 a military background. We have smart bombs now. <laughs> Ever heard of those? Oh, yeah. Are you ready for a smart bomb? The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, is the discerner of the thoughts and tents of the heart, neither is there any creature that is not naked and open before the eyes of him with whom we do. When we are measured by this standard right here, nobody's going to be fooled. The truth will come out. And you can't say, well, I, I, I was suspecting that there would be bad news about my misconduct in this Bible, so I decided not to read it. <laughs> you see where, you, I mean, this is silly. When you just stop and think, of course that won't work. Of course that, Jesus won't be deceived by that. It has to come, the hidden things have to come to light. <sighs> Here's the big problem. This is a big one. But Lord... I know I failed. I know I sinned. 
but I confess my sin. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to, to what? Forgive. Forgive us our sins and, uh, what? and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Lord, I know I did all those bad things for years to all those people, but I confess my sins or so everything's fine now. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> it's fine in one way. It's not fine in another way. Because although your relationship to God has been restored personally, there is a what? An after effect, an aftermath of the things you've done that affect other people. Example, King David and Bathsheba. Now turn, please. This is unbelievably horrible. 2 Samuel 12. Please turn. 2 Samuel chapter 12. King David a man after God's own heart who wrote half of the book of Psalms after whom Jesus is named, you know, son of David, committed a horrible crime. I don't even have to tell you. Everybody knows the crime he committed. Very few people know how marvelous he could be in his genuine repentance and his genuine love for the Lord, but he was possessed of a sin nature like all of us. And you know what he did? He deliberately murdered one of his most faithful generals in order to what? To have his wife. I mean, it's, you can't believe that, that he could have done this, folks. And you know what happened? The end of chapter 11, look at the last words of 2 Samuel 11. But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. Of course it was. You would expect that, wouldn't you? Although for months he refused to repent and confess. He wrote a whole psalm about what he went through when he did not confess his sin. Psalm 37. He said, I was totally miserable the whole time. Okay? Then he finally confessed his sin, as we'll see, and wrote another Psalm 51 to tell us what that meant. This is very important in the sight of God. So God sent a messenger to him one day the Nathan the prophet who took his life in his hands confronting David for this sin, see? I mean, you, you just don't go marching into King David and blast him and walk out un, unscathed, you know. That took courage. It often takes courage for us to confront one another, lovingly, graciously, humbly, because the attitude I have oftentimes is, well, I, I'm not perfect, so how can I confront someone else who's not perfect? See? So just let it go. Forget it. And the whole church is poisoned. Yeah. Now, now watch what Nathan said. The Lord sent Nathan to David and he said to him, there were two men in one city, the one rich, the other poor, and the rich man had a great many flocks and herds and the poor man had nothing except one lamb. You know the story, I'm not gonna read the whole thing. A guest came to the rich man's house, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it to serve his guest. And you know what King David said? Look, verse five. David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. Oh, thank you, David. You, you have great discernment here on what, how bad people can be, don't you? He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. I'm not sure if I want to see a video of what happened next. Nathan then looked at David right in his eyes and said, you are the man. You did it. You took that man's wife. You're condemned. Look at verse 9. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? Verse 10. You have despised me. Behold, verse 11, I will raise up evil against you from your own household etc. And David said in verse 13 to Nathan, are you ready? I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said, now watch it, underline it, the Lord also has taken away your sin, you shall not die. Question, was his sin forgiven? Yes. yes. Were there any consequences? Yes. yes. That's the point. Forgiveness of sin is one thing, restored to the Lord, okay? Then he wrote Psalm 51 and continued to be king of Israel, etc., etc. But the consequences were awful. 
for the rest of his life, his household was divided, his children rose up against him. You remember Amnon, yeah. Absalom, yeah. Adonijah. Horrible things. The whole kingdom was split, <coughs> practically collapsed. And I'm sure for the, re the next 20 years of his life, David said, Lord, why didn't you just kill me? <coughs> See the point? If we confess our sin, we are forgiven, but the consequences go on as to what we did to other people. See? That's the issue. That's the issue. And I say, Lord, I never quite thought of it that way. Because if, if I'm building a life of just sinning against people and hurting people and cheating people and lying to people, you know, as a Christian, to some extent or other, and then I just confess my sin, is everything fine now? Uh, I weep when I tell you what I'm going to tell you now. The Bible says... For a Christian leader in high position of authority and privilege and respect to publicly sin creates an impact on the community, are you ready, that'll never be forgotten, even though he confesses his sin. I mean, the public won't say, well, he confessed his sin, everything's fine. Oh, no. This is very complicated. We are restored to Jesus if we genuinely confess, see, but the consequences of what we've done to other people goes on and on, even to here. That's the point. That's the issue. Okay? That's right. 1 Timothy 3, 7. A pastor must have a good reputation with those who are outside the church. The whole community ought to know about him, his testimony, his manner of life. And if he has cheated people or lied to people or committed sins of one kind or another, the community is permanently affected. And he needs to resign his position and never be restored. Okay? Now, this is a controversy. This is not easy to resolve. I'm giving you my, my impression of what the Bible says about this issue. But it, the point is, God, God's reputation is damaged forever. Did you know that his reputation is damaged to this very day by what David did to Uriah the Hittite in order to obtain Bathsheba to be his wife? Hollywood loves that story. Oh, yeah, he's, he's pampered. He's God's favorite. He can get away with stuff. Oh, God's reputation has never fully recovered because of what King David did. See? And I say, Lord, I, I, th I think I'm beginning to see the point here. There has to be a confrontation with believers, perhaps tonight. If the rapture's tonight, we're all going up there. Yeah. We'll see things as we've never saw them before, about ourselves first. And Jesus will take care of what we think of other people as we see who gets a crown and who doesn't and to what extent and why. And finally, friends, I mean, this has a, an end result. Are you ready? It's right over here. At the marriage supper of the Lamb, Jesus will finally have prepared his wife, his bride to be his wife at a public ceremony, and, and the wife has made herself ready. Catch that point. She has cooperated, see, in this Bema confrontation, and every Christian will agree with Jesus as to what finally happens, as who gets a reward, how many rewards, what kind of rewards, and what's going to happen to them. All settled by here, right here. Seven years this goes on. Now, we all agree that Jesus is so intelligent, he can do the whole thing in a split second. But he's spreading it out, just like he's going to say, as we shall see, God willing, tomorrow night. The amazing things he will do to prepare Israel for the kingdom, which will take seven years, see, right here. The amazing things he'll do for all the Gentile nations to prepare them for the kingdom. What he'll do to Satan and all demons and all angels during this period here, the 70th week of Daniel is a final period of preparation for what? The second coming of Christ and the establishment of the thousand-year kingdom. Everything is meticulously planned, announced, explained. God says, trust me, I really, I really want you to know, dear child, I know what I'm doing. Uh, friends, would you agree with me this is sobering? <laughs> Maybe a little shocking? 
because I have hardly ever heard a lecture on this subject. Because in one sense, the minute we get there, we'll be joyful forevermore, but not necessarily happy. And I've never solved that problem. How long will we be unhappy? I, trust me, friends, there are many things like that. We'll say, Lord Jesus, thank you for what you told us. That's sufficient. I got the message. The details you'll work out later. Thank you. I just thank the Lord, friends, for a church like this that really wants to know what God said in the only book he's ever written and to take it seriously. We need to pray for each other, don't we? Pray for pastor. Pray for the leaders of this church. Pray for each other that we might fulfill for Jesus' sake the things that he has provided, infinite cost through his blood for our eternal good. Let's pray. Now, Father, if there's anything I've said that's out of balance, that is not really true in harmony with everything you've revealed in this precious book, the Bible, may it be blanked out of our mind and memory. If what's said is true, it is very sobering, at least for me, as I think about these things. We must be prepared to give an account to you for what we've done with what you've entrusted to us. The things that, that we've heard from, among many witnesses were to commit to faithful men who shall teach others also. Make disciples of all nations, our Lord Jesus told us, and, and teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And we say, Lord, that's impossible. Right. But I am with you always till the end of the age. So with Christ, all things are possible, even the evangelization of the world through servants that aren't brilliant or powerful or wealthy or famous, but who at least are faithful. May we be part of that wonderful group, Father, that will hear you say, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I praise and thank you in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Whitcomb. I think uh, it's appropriate that we stand and close this evening uh, with this song, an appropriate prayer for us in response to the message. Let's stand together and sing hymn number 382, Be Thou My Vision. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou in this thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and Thou only, first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure Thou art. High King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O Ruth. Amen.